All right, welcome back to the Engineering Entrepreneur Podcast, episode 41. This is your host, Scott Tarsi, and I'm also the president of CADDesignHelp.com. Sorry about the delay there. We missed a few weeks. Uh, sometimes life just gets in the way. But uh, before we get started, uh, th- some updates. 3D Print the Future TV show. We're looking at a November 8th release, I believe, on An- Amazon Instant Video. Uh, I don't know why they're holding it, but that's what they're doing. Everything's ready to go with it, though. And if you're enjoying these, I always ask for a review on iTunes. That would help me out. And finally, if you want to stay updated and everything, you can sign up for my email list on my website, caddesignhelp.com, and we'll send you a free PDF of the top four mistakes inventors make when you sign up. All right, so this episode is just going to be me talking. And what I'm going to talk about is one of my 3D printers, which is the Fusion 3 F400. So the Fusion 3. Uh, this was actually my second 3D printer, but the first one I have was the Cube 3 from 3D Systems. And that machine honestly was so bad that 3D Systems does not even sell it anymore. But it did teach me the basics of FDM printing, which if you don't know what FDM printing is, it is it stands for Fused Deposition Modeling and essentially taking a filament, a wire of plastic and melting it down and then it puts it down layer by layer. So anyways, I consider the F400 my first, you know, truly real professional 3D printer that can actually make, you know, good parts relatively fast. So before I get into what I like and don't like about it, um, I'll first explain a little bit about this machine and why I decided to purchase it. So I purchased in August of 2016. The price was around $5,000, but I think it was just a little under that with taxes and everything. Um... It is an FDM type printer, which I explained what that is, and the build volume, so how big of a part it can make, is 14 inches by 14 inches by about 12 and a half inches. And the reason I bought this machine um, was at the time, I really needed a machine that could make bigger parts. Um, a lot of the inventors that would come to me and clients that would come to me that wanted parts, honestly wanted parts bigger than you know, what I could make on most FD, certainly on my cube, but even other machines that I was outsourcing to, um, people that I was using to make parts for me before I had, you know, a good sized machine that was really capable, um, you know, that even those guys couldn't really handle it. For example, like I did a bike seat that was, you know, 10 inches long. Most uh, FDM printers are not that big. So I really needed a, a bigger machine. Um, so what do I like about it? Well, here's kind of my uh, list that I've come up with of what I like. So the first is, as I explained, it is a big machine, and that's really crucial for my business with all of these you know, larger parts. It seems like a lot of people have product ideas that are somewhere in the 8 to 12-inch range, like a bike seat, or uh, I remember doing a canister to hold like some tennis balls or something. And these parts are so big, and most FDM printers couldn't, you know, would not be capable of it. So having a printer that can do this in one run without having to split the part and glue it together... Uh, is really nice to have. Uh, The second thing I like is that it is very fast. I run this machine all the time at the default speed of 6,000 millimeters per minute. Uh, Some people think of uh, millimeters per second, so just divide by 60 and it'd be, what is that, 100 millimeters per second, which is really fast. A lot of machines are not designed to go that fast, and this one really does not have any issues going at that speed. Um... The next thing I like is the materials it can run. So a lot of people would think of the the melting temperature of the material, but it's technically called the glass transition temperature. But in any case, any material that essentially melts at 300 degrees Celsius, the Fusion F400 can run. And this is a lot of things. Uh, polycarbonate, for example, is right at 300, and a lot of machines can't quite get that high. And so this basically allows me to run a lot of different types of materials, although I end up running mostly PLA and ABS, but I do run a lot of nylons and some flexible, and it can run all those as well. Uh, The fourth thing, uh, an enclosed build chamber. Now, this is actually extremely important if you use ABS filament. Uh, One of my other machines is the Ultimaker 2 Plus Extended. Let's just call it the UM2. And what I like about this machine, while I, while I like this machine, I use it often. I have found that I can really only run small ABS parts on it. And why is that, you might ask? Well, ABS tends to shrink a lot as it cools. So you need to keep the entire part hot until you are done, 
or you have one region cooling down and shrinking while another region's not, and a lot of times the part will crack or certainly will warp. On the Ultimaker 2, it has a heated build chamber, or sorry, heated uh, bed, just like the Fusion F400 has. But the difference is that the Ultimaker doesn't have an enclosed chamber, and therefore, as the part gets taller, it's not able, to, it's not near the heat source, whereas in the essentially the temperature is dropping and it's going to become an issue. On the Fusion, because it's totally enclosed on all sides, the heat is really maintained well throughout. And I don't really ever have issues with any kind of warpage or part cracking, even on big ABS parts. And so that's really critical. And lastly, the customer service is really good. Um, I heard it was good before I bought the machine. It's one of the reasons I did it. But I knew that going into it, because I had been using other people to print some of the parts for me when I started my business, that it was going to be a big learning curve. I had just been a designer and an engineer. I had never really ran a 3d printer before and so i really needed to make sure that i could call somebody you know and have, have them w walk me through it and i don't need to do that as much as i used to but it's still nice that i can do that and they're you know they're really knowledgeable so you know i want to give an honest review on here and i can't say everything is positive although I, I i don't regret buying it i have a story basically to tell which is like the one I guess, major issue I had with this machine. And it, this goes all the way back to August of 2016. So when I first got it, the first three months, it worked pretty much like it was supposed to. And then just a lot of weird stuff started to happen. Um, I started to get jams all the time. Like the, Basically what would happen is the nozzle would get too close to the, the part or too close to the bed, and it would jam. And so when you're 3D printing, FDM printing, there's two really important things. It's make sure that the bed is level and to make sure that the Z gap or the gap between the nozzle and the bed is just about the right amount. Too far away and what will essentially happen is the plastic will be almost cool too much before it hits the bed and not even stick to it. And then the part will completely come off and you'll just be printing a big pile of spaghetti, plastic spaghetti. If you're too close, the nozzle will jam and if it keeps trying to print, sometimes the plastic will wrap around it and I'll throw a picture up on my website of this result and it's it's like this massive blob and I try to do crazy stuff try to melt it off and it, yeah don't take my advice don't try to melt ABS plastic off with a blowtorch or anything to like it's it when the, the plastic wraps around the nozzle at your hot end uh, that nozzle is, is ruined you need to replace the whole thing which is what I had to do there in any case getting back to the story I basically just kept having these issues over and over. Like I'd run one part, it be it would work, the next part would fail, and I would redo the level process, and I would redo, and I would go through the Z gap process over and over, and it just it would never work. And so eventually, one day, I think around November of sixteen, I actually rented a van, it cost me like two hundred dollars because the machine is huge, and it wouldn't fit my car, and put it in my car and drove two hours north from Charlotte to Greensboro to their headquarters and sat there all day as they troubleshoot troubleshooted it. And they basically told me it was good. And when I got back, yeah, it ran fine for like a month. But then just all the problems started happening again. So what what ended up doing was we came to an agreement where they were willing to swap this machine out for, you know, one of their test units. I think I just paid for the shipping. And Shortly after I got that one, I kept having the same problems again. It was just really bizarre. Um, I'm estimating I spent 200 plus hours of my time troubleshooting this machine. It was it was very frustrating. But ultimately, what I ended up doing was we tried all of these things. You know, I was going through the, all these processes. We were we were trying every test print and every little thing to try to get the thing to print reliably. And ended up one day, I don't know why. But this is probably what it all comes down to, but. The light sensor. So there's a sensor on there that's on the hot end, that the part the, where the nozzle is, where it's moving around. It essentially, auto calibrates as it moves. So because the bed is so large, I think this is actually pretty critical. They have this part. This sensor, the bed will actually adjust as it prints across. Is my understanding. And so because the sensor was bad, if the bed wasn't perfectly level, the gap wasn't perfectly right, and the part pretty much had to be a small part, it would jam. And pretty much since I replaced that uh, light sensor three months ago, I haven't had any issues. So it's kind of one of those things where it's like 
if I had just done that first, I probably would have saved hundreds of hours of work trying to get the thing to work correctly. And it was just kind of, you know, maybe just bad luck that that's, you know, it took so long before we thought to replace that part. So anyways, that summarizes that entire story of uh, what I had with this machine. But, um, you know, wrapping up my review, I, I think it's a great machine. You know, it is a little pricier compared to other FDM printers, but it's fast. And, you know, I guess a lesson learned in that story of all the problems I had is that, you know, simply 3D printing is a is tricky. And sometimes, you know, I, you just get unlucky and maybe you have an issue like that. But, you know, you'll learn from it as I did. And now I know that if I start to have consistent problems, it's probably the light sensor that needs to be replaced. So. Anyways, hope uh, anyone out there interested in getting a 3D printer or had thought about getting the Fusion F400 would uh, take this for what it's worth. Uh, I do recommend them as a company. All uh, right. Well, the good news is on the podcast, I've got two more lined up. Uh, I've got um, a couple of guys that do 3D printing, I think, for pretty much for a living like myself. So we should have some good conversations uh, in the next few weeks. There will be two more episodes. Thanks. We'll catch you next time.